With Bacteroides fraudulus, Bacteria means rod, Oides means shape, and Fraudulus means fragile. So, Bacteroides fraudulus is a gram-negative, rod-shaped bacterium. Although it's generally considered rod-shaped, it can range from a sphere to a rod shape, so it's considered a pleomorphic bacterium. Bacteroides fraudulus inhabits the human colon, and from all the Bacteroides species, it's responsible for most human infections. Now, a little bit more about this microbe. For starters, Bacteroides fraudulus is gram-negative, which means that it has a thin peptidoglycan cell wall that can't readily retain purple dye when gram-stained. Additionally, it's a non-spore-forming and non-motile bacteria. It's also an obligate anaerobe, meaning that it can only live without oxygen. Another fact is that it's bile-resistant and seems to like bile, which makes sense since it lives in the colon. So, not only can it grow anaerobically in blood agar, but it can also readily grow in bile esculin agar, also known as Bacteroides bile esculin. After 48 hours of incubation at 35 degrees Celsius, Bacteroides fraudulus forms dark colonies with brown-black halos due to the hydrolysis of esculin. Finally, a disc test can be done, which identifies Bacteroides fraudulus by its resistance to antibiotics like canamycin, vancomycin, and colistin. Okay, so normally, Bacteroides fraudulus colonizes the human colon peacefully without causing any trouble. However, trauma or surgery may damage the intestinal wall, which allows Bacteroides fraudulus to slip into the bloodstream. From there, it can travel to virtually any organ in the body. Alternatively, it can slip into the sterile peritoneal cavity accompanied by aerobic bacteria like E. coli, which are also part of the normal gut flora. So peritoneal infections are usually considered polymicrobial infection to reflect that there's more than one culprit. Now, in the peritoneal cavity, Bacteroides fraudulus can use its virulence factors and cause disease. First, it has a lipopolysaccharide capsule, or LPS for short, which it uses to attach to the surface of the peritoneal cavity. At the same time, the aerobic bacteria that tagged along remove the oxygen from the peritoneal cavity, allowing Bacteroides fraudulus, the obligate anaerobe, to proliferate. The bacterial presence in the peritoneal cavity arouses a stream of neutrophils to the site of the infection. However, the anaerobic metabolism of Bacteroides fraudulus generates succinic acid, which inhibits the function of neutrophils so they can't neutralize Bacteroides fraudulus. What is more, the LPS capsule of Bacteroides fraudulus is also slippery and slimy, so it prevents phagocytosis. The bacteria literally slip from the immune cell's grasp. Finally, the LPS initiates a unique immune response which promotes abscess formation in the peritoneal cavity. Okay. Now, there are some strains of Bacteroides fraudulus called enterotoxigenic Bacteroides fraudulus, which secrete a heat labile zinc metalloprotease toxin. The reason behind this is not well understood, but it's possible that non-enterotoxigenic species that normally reside in the colon undergo mutations that make them more virulent. This toxin stimulates IL-8 secretion, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that causes damage to the intestinal epithelium. So fluid and chloride are secreted into the intestinal lumen, causing inflammatory diarrhea. Finally, even though it's not part of the normal skin flora, Bacteroides fraudulus is also one of the most common causes of foot infections in people with diabetes. Now, symptoms vary widely depending on the site of the infection. For example, Intra-abdominal infections may cause a fever, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and a distended abdomen. With skin infections, there's pus, necrotic tissue, and a bad characteristic odor, characteristic of anaerobic infections. And with inflammatory diarrhea, there's abdominal pain and, well, watery diarrhea. Diagnosis is made by isolating Bacteroides fraudulus in cultures from biological samples, like peritoneal fluid, pus, or stool. Gas liquid chromatography, a process that analyzes compounds that can be vaporized, 
can also be used to identify the specific compounds produced by Bacteroides fraudulus, like acetic and succinic acids. Gene sequencing can also be used to identify the bacteria. A computed tomography scan may show abscesses or the presence of gas at the infected site. Treatment of Bacteroides fraudulus infections consists of antibiotics and drainage of abscesses or debridement of necrotic tissues. However, since Bacteroides fraudulus produces beta-lactamase, beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin cannot be used. Metronidazole or a combination of beta-lactam and beta-lactamase inhibitors like ampicillin and sulbactam are efficient. All right, as a quick recap, Bacteroides fraudulus is a gram-negative, pleomorphic, rod-shaped bacterium that resides in the colon of humans. It grows on blood agar, bile esculent agar, and it's resistant to canamycin, vancomycin, and colistin. It's the most common anaerobic bacteria found in peritoneal infections and foot infections in patients with diabetes mellitus. Treatment consists of drainage of abscesses and debridement of necrotic tissue and antibiotics like metronidazole.